Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau, ti he Māori ora. E na mana, e na reo, a ra raka te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, tēnā te raru, e te maru o ka mana whenua, uh, ka te māmoi, waitaha, uh, kaitahu, no mai, haramai, tauti mai. I stand here under the cloak and the umbrella of people of this place uh, to give you greetings. Um, uh, Ki te whare, uh, tu nei, ki te nākwe, uh, tu tonu, tu tonu, to the house that stands here, stand forever. Uh, but in case there is some doubt about that, um, emergency <laughs> exits are to the left and the right, and please follow a staff member if we do need to evacuate. They will help find a, a good place to be. E na mate haere, haere hoki atu rā ki te pō. Um, uh, uh, Kia ora everyone, welcome. Um, I'll go through quite a number of greetings because we've got a number of people to, to welcome especially tonight. Anna uh, Rangatira, uh, Eoraki, Lisa, uh, Christine, um, Neil, uh, Will, uh, Patricia, uh, other uh, of our distinguished leaders here at the University of Otago, uh, Tēnā Koe. Uh, and of course, um, of course, Louise uh, Ehorangi, uh, Louise Pa Brownie, uh, Tena, Tena Koto, or oh, sorry, Tena Kwe, Tena Koto, others. Um, we have um, a number of special guests. I'd like to particularly welcome uh, Professors Di McCarthy and Jim Metzen, uh, special visitors today, uh, Tena Kaurua. And um, uh, we're celebrating an inaugural prof professorial lecture, which is the journey uh, of an academic to our peak. Uh, academic position here at the University of Otago, and it's an occasion that uh, is often shared with special uh, guests, far now of the of the recipient. And so, with us here, uh, Gordon, uh, Louise's husband, uh, your father Barry, welcome, um, sister and brother Amy and Jonathan, uh, and in-laws Jackie, Stephen, Karen, and Joe, and. Uh, uh, Cousin Mark that have come uh, tēnā koutou to you all uh, and I understand uh, that there are a number of special guests, uh, family, friends, supporters, uh, what have we got, mentees, collaborators and colleagues from both Dunedin and uh, the hallway father, the four winds that are here joining us in person or online. So welcome, welcome and thrice welcome. And also welcome to those members of the university community and the members of the Dunedin public who have joined us here tonight for the celebration. And inaugural professorial lectures are just that. And oh, by the way, um, ko waiau, uh, ko Richard Blakey taka wingawa, um, no otapoti ahau, um, ko katora ni te iwi hei kaimahi aha te wharewananga o Otago. I'm uh, Richard Blakey, I'm a Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Enterprise, and uh, bring the greetings of the Vice-Chancellor, Professor David Murdoch, who unfortunately is not able to join us tonight, uh, to join in the celebration uh, of Louise's promotion. <clears throat> uh, professorial lectures are a time where we as academic leaders of the university not only can invite um, others to, to, to hear the story of someone's academic journey to professorship, often which incorporates a personal journey as well, but also um, it's actually a bit of a selfish time. It's academic spa time for us that allows us to just learn something new about one, one of our colleagues and understand the depth and breadth of their scholarship. Um, promotion to professor is a... Um, a very, very significant achievement, and uh, we use international benchmarking in order to determine who should uh, be awarded such privilege. The criteria are demanding and require significant um, performance at the highest in international level across teaching, research and service, the core components of our university uh, academic roles. But in particular, what we look for is leadership and sustained leadership. And um, uh, following me, uh, Professor Matthew Smith, the Dean of the School of Biomedical Science, will give a more detailed introduction to Professor uh, Pa Brownlee's career. And you'll see that um, not only has her research been at the highest level across a number of disciplines, her teaching and commitment to teaching is very, very impressive. Uh, but in particular, service and leadership leadership are things that um, I, I am very, very appreciative of uh, in my role as, uh, as a senior leader in the university, but also I sit and wonder at how all of these things are achieved through one individual. So um, 
Uh, the order of proceedings is that we'll have uh, a, a more formal introduction for our speaker. Louise will talk. There will be a number of uh, thanks and congratulations, uh, including uh, a vote of thanks, after which we'll invite you all to the staff club to join us in celebration. So um, before Professor Matisu Smith comes up to give a more detailed introduction, please, Louise, accept on behalf of the university our most heartfelt and hearty congratulations for your promotion. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, ko Lisa Marisu Smith tōko ingoa. Uh, ko te tumuaki o te kura. Uh, uh, matai rongoa, ko roa, ahau. Uh, my name is Lisa Madison Smith, and um, as Professor Blakey said, I am the acting dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences, um, and it truly is uh, an honor and a pleasure and a joy to be introducing uh, Louise and her IPL tonight. I was formerly uh, the head of Department of Anatomy, so um, I not only got to work with Louise, teaching with Louise, uh, in, in some of the very first teaching that I did here when I got to the University of Otago, we taught some musculoskeletal uh, sections together. Um, but as head of department, I got to be part of the planning process, I suppose, to, to get uh, Louise to this point uh, tonight. So it is truly, um, truly a joy to have, have watched her progress um, through the ranks of lecturer and senior lecturer and associate professor, uh, and so des deservedly um, here tonight. So a bit about Louise. We're going to hopefully, or we will, I'm sure, be hearing a lot more about Louise uh, and her journey. So I will try to just keep this short, because it will be much more interesting uh, coming directly from her. But. Um, Louise started uh, here at the University of Otago doing a Bachelor uh, of Physical Education, uh, which she obtained in 1992, and then went on to go be a uh, teaching fellow and then senior teaching fellow in the Department of Physiology here at the University of Otago, uh, followed by a Master of Science in uh, Physiology uh, from Otago, which was awarded in 1999. Um, this was followed uh, by her PhD uh, in physiology in 2003, and then she went uh, off and did the classic postdoctoral fellowship and research fellowship at the Neurophysiological Pharmacology section at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the National Institute of Health in the US. She came back to New Zealand, uh, very thankfully, and worked as a research fellow in the Department of Physiology. And then we stole her um, in the Department of Anatomy, uh, which she joined as a lecturer in 2010, uh, then was promoted to senior lecturer in 2015, associate professor in 2020. And here we are now uh, at this wonderful celebration of your professorship. So as you've already heard, and as it will be very, very clear um, after tonight's uh, IPO, Louise is a national and international leader um, in biomedical research. Um, her research examines the role of the motor thalamus in controlling movements and explores how the structure is affected in movement disorders and translates her findings to explore potential future treatment options. Uh, in the middle of about 2018, her lab began to use qualitative t techniques also to explore Maori perspectives on neurologic, uh, neurosurgical techniques to treat neurological disease and traumatic, traumatic brain injury. Her study was funded by the BRNZ, uh, the Brain Research, uh, brain Research Institute of New Zealand, <laughs> um, and uh, their um, Preliminaries finding, findings basically allowed them to continue uh, to obtain research funding to look at um, how Māori have traditionally maintained brain health uh, and treated brain disorders. Now, currently, sadly, there are no treatments uh, to prevent Parkinson's disease, but Louise's lab um, is working on really understanding how neuroinflammation underlies Parkinson's disease to test dietary components and drugs that might slow or stop the progression of the disease, and I guess we'll be hearing um, quite a lot about this um, tonight. 
So her research has been funded uh, through a range of, of agencies, Health Research Council, Marsden Fund, uh, BRNZ, the core or center of uh, research excellence, um, and the Neurological Foundation of New Zealand, among others. Um, and her leadership, and in, in internationally, her leadership in Parkinson's disease was, um, was recognized uh, when she was made a secretary of the Council for the International Basal Ganglia Society, um, and of course, through the numerous invitations she has uh, internationally to give plenaries and, um, and, and research talks on her, on her work. Um, but what has been truly amazing to kind of watch happen is that real leadership um, and in science leadership that uh, Louise has really uh, moved into over the last five years, I suppose. Um, in particular, um, her, her work with the Aging Well National Science Challenge, um, where she started as deputy director in 2018 and then 2019 uh, co-director of Aging Well, and then from 2020 uh, through now, she is the, the director of the, the Aging Well National Science Challenge. Um, she's also the chair of the Rawika Mangai Maori Directors and Vision Mataranga Leaders across the 11 national uh, science challenges. She's also uh, a member of Napai o Te Maramatanga, the Center of Research Excellence um, that's based up, the, up at, in Auckland. Um, she is uh, part of numerous research themes, both in terms of, of her Parkinson's research and um, the impact of her research uh, for Maori and in New Zealand more generally. Um, of course, she has also um, been involved with the Ministry of Health uh, in steering groups implementing, implementing healthy aging strategies um, and with the Ministry uh, for the Environment, Mataranga Science and Insights, uh, contributing to, to the panel research there. In addition to all of this, of course, she's still supervising numerous students, PhD students, master's students, and honors students. Um, and, uh, doing an outstanding job teaching in um, not just the anatomy program, but, but several other programs across the division. Uh, I've been speaking enough, and I don't want to go on anymore because it's much more uh, important that we hear the story um, of this amazing weaving of Mataranga Māori and, and science. Um, and. Uh, Please join me then in welcoming Louise to present her IPL, which is so aptly entitled, Weaving Equity and Innovation into Parkinson's Research. Ahiahi Marie, uh, in a mana in a row, ro, rangatira ma, uh, tena ratato. Namihiki na uh, rangatira, uh, ki tokufano, ki e haoma, ki uh, kai mahi o te fariwananga o atako. No mahari mai ki tene fai kororo e te wane. Uh, Tene te mihi ki a koto kato, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. So my goodness, it's a pleasure to be here today and to see so many friends in the audience and students and so many people that have contributed to my journey. Um, thank you to the university leaders for that lovely introduction um, and to my family and friends, so many of you have traveled so far in order to be here, so I really appreciate that. And um, I appreciate all of you taking a little bit of time out of your day to come and listen to about my research journey. This is a huge moment for me. It's actually the first time that any of my family have heard me talk, and most of my friends away from the university have ever heard me talk as well. So um, buckle up, we're going on a journey, um, and you're about to find out um, exactly what I've been doing with my career. So the place I'm going to start, uh, Kōwaiō, I'm actually going to start with the par side of the family. Um, in Dad's word, we come from northern Nottinghamshire, um, in the, from Robin Hood country. And we've been there for many centuries. 
Now, the men of Dad's family um, have mostly worked down the pit or the coal mines, but Dad had a different journey. He became a toolmaker, and that gave him the opportunity to actually immigrate to New Zealand. On my mum's side, all of my grandparents were born in Aotearoa, New Zealand, throughout the North Island. But my grandparents, they'd all moved, um, and by the time they, my grandparents came along, they were all living in Tamaki Makauru. So my whakapapa comes from my maternal grandmother, called Tainui Mati Aroa no Waka Kondati Manapoto Te Iwi. Yet, I have two French names. So I'm actually named after one of my mother's favourite aunties, Auntie Lou, and my uh, middle names I share with my, grand my, my nana, my mother, and also my niece, um, Shelby. So in my early years, I grew up in Tall Bay in Tamaki Makoro, and it was a life where I was um, playing with, on bikes and homemade trolleys um, in the cul-de-sac with all the neighbourhood kids. The whānau always gathered um, at our grandparents' place um, in Glen Innes uh, for Christmas, for birthdays, for actually anything. And during that time, we would be playing board games, we would be playing cards, and they had a um, mini golf uh, area outside. And so we would always have this gathering of whānau and this really positive energy whenever we were together. But as a kid, I was mad on sport and I played netball, basketball, ran uh, athletics and cross country, but the sport that I loved and I was best at was orienteering. And orienteering, the reason I loved it is because there was all the problem solving that went along as I was going around the um, event and I got to go to some really remote places that you don't normally get to see, so it was a really privilege to be able to do that. Now, in my late teenage years, my life became the circle of training, then going and working, so that I could then go and travel and uh, go to all these events and compete. And I've put a couple of photos up there that are very memorable for me. The one at the bottom is the first time New Zealand team been Australia in the Trans-Tasman competition, which is awesome. And then the top one, um, what's memorable about that one, I was in Australia for the first time, and I was running along in a grassy area, and um, all I heard, think of Jurassic Park, dinosaurs coming along, bang, bang, bang. And what I turned around was um, there were these giant red, a mob of giant red kangaroos coming along. And I couldn't believe it, I sort of stopped, and just watched them and then kind of went, oh, come on, you're competing, and then continued on. So it was this love of sport that meant that I came to Otago to do a Bachelor of Phys Physical Education. But there was no expectation I would, because all of my whānau, they're mostly tradies. Um, so they were really supportive of me doing this, but this was an unusual step in our whānau. But I didn't want to do biology, chemistry, or physics, yet I do all of them now. Um, and I remember saying at the end of my final year at school, well, if I don't get into physics at school, I'm not going to go at all. So somehow, um, applying the knowledge uh, of science and, um, was just the right thing for me. And phys ed was also a really good choice. So at that time, it was a closed course with only 100 places and over 800 people applied. And my classmates originally were my friends, but because of the events that we did, going to camp and going to prax, and the teamwork and the trust that you had to have with them, they actually became a Dunedin whānau. And I ended up flatting with a bunch of them and staying good friends with so many of them throughout my life. And about a year after this, there were a couple of key events that happened over a six month period. So the first one is I met Gordon, and my family got even bigger, so thank you, Brownlees. Um, over the years, our values and priorities have made it so easy for us to be together, but our differences have kept it all really interesting. So for you, Gordon, you're a first-generation New Zealander of Scots descent, um, and your work has been in construction and um, heavy transport. So that means I know way too much about logbook regulations, and I know that tyres on graders are ballasted, um, but that knowledge keeps me grounded into the other jobs that people have. But over the years, you've also learnt to navigate having an academic wife. And so when you ask questions, you ask them very carefully. And I'm sure the words that you use before I start, you, you actually give me the questions are, I want the short answer, not the scientist answer. <laughs> it turns out that that was a really good way of making me become a good science communicator. Know your audience and target your message. Keep it succinct. 
But I have a word to say to my Aging Well colleagues. So a few years ago, I got a secret Santa present um, and I had very clear instructions on how this had to be used. Um, so I'm sure Gordon is forever grateful to them for this, these series of cups. So Gordon, thank you for sharing my life and sharing my journey. You support me in more ways than you can, I can ever um, explain and it's been a pleasure um, over the years. So the other event that happened around that same time is I became a teaching fellow in physiology and I loved teaching, but the, for this particular journey, it was the opportunity to have my eyes opened to research. Um, and I did a couple of summer scholarships and then went on to postgraduate study. So I had a group of postgraduate friends and colleagues that are lifelong friends. And even now, when I play a game of uh, Settlers of Catan with Di and Fran, first of all, my ears burn because they swear so much, but then um, it's all the memories of people and places and the things that we did back in those years that I really, really treasure. I did my PhD um, in physiology as well, and I did it with um, Brian Highland, and I found my topic when I was preparing for a scholarship application and I was doing some reading. I was like, oh, Parkinson's disease, yeah, that's what I might want to do. And then I was doing a little bit more reading and there's this bit of the brain called the motor cortex and it's really important because it's the last place where me messages on the brain that control movement are processed before they go down the spinal cord out to the muscles and end up creating the movement. So, you know, in Parkinson's disease, when you have movement deficits, you'd expect that there would be changes there, but there wasn't that much known about it. And as I was going through and doing that reading, I got that real fire in my belly. This is what I wanted to do, and it's really stepped me forward uh, for the rest of my career. So as mentioned previously by Lisa, um, I did have the opportunity to head over to the United States um, to the National Institutes of Health um, in Bethesda, which is just out of Washington, DC. And it was a really special time. It was a different culture and a, a situation where the money available for research was much more than what we have in New Zealand very generally. So I got the privilege of being instructed, well, what are you interested in doing? As long as you're doing something in Parkinson's disease and in these area, movement areas of the brain, then that will be fine. So what I ended up doing was recording from a number of these different brain structures to understand how activity changed in Parkinson's disease. But more importantly, I wanted to understand how information flow through them changed. So before I head in and dive into some, uh, some of the research that I've done, I want to catch everyone up um, about Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's is an age-related neurodegenerative disorder where dopamine cells that are deep in the brain, so if you think about your eye level, um, right in the middle there, those cells die off. And as a consequence of that, people end up with um, altered movements. There are also Lewy bodies that form. So Lewy bodies are created when a protein called alpha-synuclein accumulate in cells. And when that happens, the cell function alters and then cells can die off. So they do accumulate in dopamine cells, but they accumulate in many, many other types of cells in the brain and also the gut. And what happens is that um, when these dopamine cells die off, it affects the passage of um, information through this motor pathway, and the, the information is going much slower than it really should, and that's what underlies the movement deficits. So to ex show you what someone uh, with Parkinson's disease, what those symptoms are like, their movements are much slower. So I'm going to show you a video where um, this woman's uh, movements on both sides are, are affected, but the left side is more affected. But also have a look at her face. She has a very mask-like expression, um, and even blinking and smiling are very, very slow as well. And you'll also see the, the altered uh, walking.
I'm sure you can imagine with those um, altered movements, life becomes more difficult. Uh, it's harder to complete everyday tasks. So for people living with Parkinson's disease, often one of the first things that's recommended to them is that they stay active for as long as possible. The next treatment option is that they are offered a drug, often it's levodopa, and it is a wonder drug for about eight years. And then about 80% of people with Parkinson's disease end up with a, um, a side effect called dyskinesias in which there are far too many movements and they can no longer control them. So I'm about to show you a video of what dyskinesias look like. And during this, um, what you'll see is um, the dyskinesias initially, and then uh, there's another treatment called deep brain stimulation. So you'll see uh, the woman clear, she then has a hat on, and she'll, you'll see the effect of a deep brain stimulator being um, inserted and turned on. Well, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in the year 2000, and the dyskinesia um, it's much more recent than that. It's been particularly bad the last four or five months. One thing that's pretty obvious to me is this coffee cup. I was able to drink out of that without spilling it down my front for the first time in a long time. And how many days is the op now? About nine, I think. What's happening with your dyskinesia now? Oh, it's gone. It's just not here anymore. It's just amazing. It's a miracle. Like. So it's a miracle. That's pretty powerful words. But like all treatments, deep brain stimulation does have side effects such as depression, altered speech and impulsivity. So in essence, the treatments are helpful, but they do need to be improved. So I'm going to pick up my research story and dive in a bit deeper from this point. And I chose this point because um, it is the first grant that I applied for as a principal investigator or a lead scientist, and I actually got it from the Neurological Foundation. And it ended up being a really important uh, mark in my career in order to get my faculty job in anatomy. So I had this before I applied for my job. Because I had this, um, I was able to bring a, a postdoctoral fellow in because I was no longer going to be able to do the bench work. So my lab suddenly flourished and I started charging ahead. So in this project, what I wanted to do was record from cells in the motor thalamus. So we know the areas of the brain before and after in this pathway affected, but we didn't know what happened here. And I just wondered if perhaps this might be a really critical site that might be able to offer treatments in the future. And they really hadn't explored that. So what we do is we use a rat model of Parkinson's disease and we train our rats to execute a reaching task. Now we use reaching um, because the reaching in humans and rats actually activates the same muscles in the same order. So it's a really good skilled task for them to do. And rats are really dexterous with their paws as well. In addition, when a rat is Parkinsonian, the um, changes that occur are very similar to humans too. So a little bit of data, so what we're doing here is recording from single cells in the brain and we've recorded from, on the y-axis on the left-hand side, just over 80 cells. And we're looking at the changes in neural activity um, uh, over about a one second period and time zero is when the rat's paw is just obtaining the food. The green colour in this graph indicates when we have a resting level of activity. The red and yellow in the middle at time zero is um, when there's a significant increase in activity. So the firing rate increases just as the rat is grabbing the food. But before that, some cells reduce their firing rate. And that's really important because in order to execute a movement, you have to stop unwanted movement. So that's what we think that signal is. And then after you've done the movement, you need to stop it, because if you keep going, you won't be doing what you really want to do. So um, after time zero, you can see there's another great big um, area of blue, which is uh, a decrease in firing rate as well. So that's from a control rat. In a Parkinsonian rat, what we found is that increase in activity at time zero remained. We were surprised by that. But interestingly, it's the decrease in firing rate before and afterwards that disappeared. And these are the messages that are, of course, going to stop movements, the unwanted movements, or stop them at the end, and they're impaired. And that means the timing of muscle contractions are also impaired. 
So from here, I started to ask a lot of questions. And when I was a kid, um, my grandfather, I, I think I traumatized him because I asked him so many questions all the time. And I, um, I remember him always talking about that. So the questions that came up from this project were, um, is the motor thalamus, could it be a site for brain stimulation? Can brain stimulation be more selective? Can we reduce those side effects? And are there better patterns of stimulation to recover movements? So deep brain stimulation, top left. Um, we put an electrode in, into the brain. Um, it's fixed in there. There's then a wire that's fed underneath the skin uh, to a pacemaker that sits in the chest. And that pacemaker is very similar to the pacemaker that people have for their heart. At the tip of the electrode on the bottom left hand side, there are two points of contact and current spreads between them. And all the cells that are around where that current is, their, cell act their activity will change. The problem with the side effects is that sometimes cells are sitting in an area outside that have a different function, but these long processes of these cells pass and come into the current, and that's how we think some of the side effects occur. So I'd been working to bring um, a new technique called optogenetic stimulation to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I wanted to use this to try and reduce the side effects. So what we do here, or in fact what a colleague Steph Hughes does, um, we have a viral vector here, um, and we've all seen um, viruses and spike proteins uh, over the last couple of years with COVID. So what happens is we take the virus's genetic code out and we insert inside the um, code for, a, um, for a, a protein that's going to enable us to stimulate the brain with light. So on the right hand side, that big blue structure is a protein that's now sitting in the cell membrane of our target cells, and it sits closed. But every time we do a flash of blue light, that protein opens and then that cell is active. And I can control the activity of the cells by putting through any type of pattern that I like. So what we did, um, we stimulated with many different types of pattern, and the first one at the top there is 130 stimuli per second. Now that's what they use for electrical deep brain stimulation. That is not how the brain works, but it is an effective treatment. And our brain codes information by having bursts of activity, so we wanted to put through quite different patterns. So a burst pattern, three stimuli close together and a wee bit of pause, and it continues on and on. The next um, pattern down is actually real neural activity that we'd previously recorded from the motor thalamus of a control rat executing a reach, and we took that and used that as the timing to then stimulate the brain of our, our Parkinsonian rat. And we wondered whether we could rec um, recover uh, movement with that. So what we have here is a Parkinsonian rat, um, and he's meant to be reaching, and I'm going to turn the video on in a second. You will see that he doesn't really do anything. He doesn't move away, his head bops up and down, his ears do move, um, but he's orientated because um, there'll be, where the arrow is, a little food pallet there, a treat, and he wants to reach for it, but he's Parkinsonian, so he doesn't. And so Parkinsonian rats don't really do anything too interesting, but, when we applied blue light stimulation in these burst patterns for almost 20 minutes, so this is the same rat on the same experiment, what you can see is that rat is able to reach into that feeding tube and grab the food and eat it. And what we're seeing is that there's a significant improvement in um, function. So at this point, um, in order to do these experiments, uh, if you think about someone with dialysis, they go into the hospital, they get connected up to a machine, and then they have to sit there for a few hours, and then they walk away. They get disconnected and they walk away. So our rats are very similar in that regard. They come in, we connect them up to the blue light stimulator, and then we disconnect them to, to put them back into their home environment. But if this is ever gonna be a treatment, we needed to have a device that could be implanted, and we turn it on and it stays on for months and months at a go. So I was fortunate enough to uh, meet up with some bioengineers from Auckland University, and they had already started to develop a blue light stimulating device. Um, so we came along and we did the beta testing, and essentially we took it, we were planting it, we were giving them feedback around, oh, well, we need these kind of features for this to, to be a useful tool for us. And oh, can you change it so that you know, when we implant it, um, we can fix it in, there in, uh, in better ways. So what we did, 
we would turn our stimulator on, and we'd turn it on, in this case, with the data on the right-hand side, for 10 weeks. We have uh, two groups of rats here. The blue line is a group of rats that they did have a viral vector, but it didn't have that light-activated protein. And this is our control in this experiment. And what is important about that is that that light actually will heat up the brain a little bit, and that heat could have changed function. But what you see is that the number of reaches that were happening there, there was no change. But in our rats that did have this active protein, there was a significant increase in um, performance here for at least the first six, uh, six weeks. And then for some reason that we still don't necessarily understand, performance dropped off. So we're trying to tease that out and understand what was happening. So from here, um, this device has been commercialised, so it's now with um, AD Instruments, which is a, an international company that started here in um, Dunedin over 30 years ago. So anyone can come and buy it now. Um, but I was actually standing or sitting and thinking about this for the last few years that we're doing this project, and I started thinking about, well, actually, only about 10 people per year out of the over 10,000 people with Parkinson's disease actually get offered deep brain stimulation as a treatment. And the reason they're really, really selective on who they offer it to, um, because as we age, our health um, becomes much more complex, and as that happens, then we don't become a candidate for such a, an invasive um, technique. And so if I stop and think about my own whānau um, and that the fact that Māori generally have poorer health and we don't live as long, then actually it's not going to be a treatment that many people that I know might be getting. And so I actually stood back and started thinking about, well, what should I be doing? I can't keep going on with this inequity. I left that project um, on the whole, and I started thinking about what I might be doing in the future. So a couple of other projects that I've been working on. So I had the opportunity of working with these wonderful wahini Māori, and one of them is over there on the left-hand side. Um, and we were looking at Māori perspectives to do with neurological disorders and stroke. And so the whānau uh, of people that had undergone a neurological event were interviewed, and they'd ask what was important and what sort of um, uh, experiences they had. And they talked about karakia being important for safety and guidance, but also for the transition states between uh, the, brain, the, the body being tapu to making it noa in order for surgery and then transitioning it back. The importance of whakapapa, knowing your um, history, you knowing your whānau, um, and then reciting that to remain connected and feeling of belonging. And also the importance of whānau support, that that person who's had that neurological event needs to get well, so the whole whānau as well. So I wasn't surprised, but um, new technologies um, can be helpful, but they can actually exacerbate inequities. And what we're looking for is accessible treatments that are fit for purpose. And we want services that uh, better meet Māori needs, and um, what was coming out in the interviews were the holistic approaches that they were looking for. And so I started to think more and more about holistic approaches, and I was fortunate that um, Elodie Kip joined the lab, and uh, she has a background in inflammation um, and viruses, and we started thinking about, well, what is the role of inflammation in Parkinson's disease, and how might we harness that in order to maybe treat Parkinson's differently? So on the left-hand side, we've got um, positive ageing on the left-hand side and um, age, the ageing experience perhaps um, with someone with a neurodegenerative disease or a psychiatric disease. And generally with neurodegenerative diseases, there is, the body is in, a, in an increased inflammatory state. And uh, things like um, there's generally poor sleep, uh, the, if, can, poor sleep and uh, high fat diets um, can contribute to uh, someone going into a, an inflammatory state. But there are also opportunities to harness this knowledge so that we reduce the, the inflammatory state. So exercising, having a good um, diet and sleeping well, and in particular a ketogenic uh, diet reduces the inflammatory state of the brain. And there was a study that came out of Waikato um, where they um, were getting people living with Parkinson's disease, um, to be on a ketogenic for eight, diet for eight weeks. And what they found was there was a significant improvement in their symptoms. 
So we, a group of colleagues from here from Otago, and again, several of them are in the audience, we started talking about, well, what's happening in the brain? What are the changes in the chemicals? And instead of having someone do the diet, which diets we all know are really tough to, to um, stay um, with all the time, but could we take some of that knowledge about those chemical changes and shortchange the process and actually look at new treatments? Now, this is really important because um, what we've been learning more recently is that the gut and the brain are intimately linked. So um, in neurological disorders, often the gut is really leaky. And what that happens is that things are getting into our bloodstream and increasing the immune system response and the inflammatory response. And that then means that the brain tends to be um, very leaky as well. And so you have neuroinflammation and that's when the dopamine cells are more likely to die. So we wanted to look at, can we use dietary intervention to reduce symptoms? So on the right hand side, you can see um, a set of experiments. This is actually quite hot off the press like last week. Um, what we have at the top is our control animals uh, performing a uh, movement task. And um, our Parkinsonian animals, we've actually created a new model where not only do the dopamine cells die off, but we set up an inflammatory state in the gut to mimic what actually happens in Parkinson's disease. But the really interesting thing here is if, if we um, administer a dietary component to them, then we could significantly improve the symptoms. Not back to um, our control state, but we could definitely make things better. So what we want to do now is look at the tissues and see whether dopamine, like fewer dopamine cells have died off um, and start to harness this knowledge. So at this point, I want to um, thank so many people from my lab for sharing this journey and all the collaborators that um, have, have done projects with me. Um, I've only talked about a tiny number of them, um, but there are many, many people to thank and far too many to get photos on. So I want to change topic a little bit um, because science is changing how it might be done, uh, so that questions are being more driven by communities, so that there are real world solutions for what need, is needed at the ground. And National Science Challenges started in 2014, and this was an opportunity to do science differently. For it to be mission led, what are the big questions that are there that we can address? And to have impact by changing uh, people's lives, by changing service delivery, and changing policies up in the ministries. So in early 2018, I thought I was going along for a coffee with uh, Moana Theodore. What it turned out is I was having a much deeper conversation about potentially might I be interested in joining Aging Well. And I kind of sat there with my brain going, you're too busy, you've got too much on, what are you doing? But I did have a really good conversation with her. And um, I asked if there was any document that I could read about what they envisaged doing for the next few years. So at this time, Aging Well was just putting together their future strategy. We're about to go to the ministry in order to get another five years of funding. And they gave me a chunk of that document in the middle. And I read it and I went, oh my goodness, I need to get rid of some stuff and I need to be doing this. And it was such an important decision in my life. So, um, Back in 2016, the reason I said I needed to join this kaupapa, back in 2016, Di McCarthy, who was the chair at the time, and Dave Baxter, who was the director, had made important strategic decisions. They saw a vision of how to do science differently. So what they did is they changed the governance group so that half of the members were Māori. They established a deputy chair position, which Will um, took that position, and he's going to be speaking in a moment. And they established a deputy director Māori position, which Moana initially had, and then I stepped into. And they also brought Korehata into the whanau. So he's the kaumatua for Aging Well, and he oversees everything we do and makes sure we do it properly. So from that future strategy document, what I realised was instead of working to the vision Matauranga policy, how to do things to better meet Māori needs, instead of doing it at a compliance level, we were charging ahead and we were going to be moving towards Tariti partnership. There were Māori values and principles absolutely embedded in that document and the way they spoke about their role of whānau, the role of intergenerational, I was hooked. 
But the big thing was that we were going to have equitable um, outcomes by having equitable funding. So at that point, we envisaged that 40% of our funding would go to Māori-led projects. So what happened? There was a lot of really strategic good decisions by Di and Dave and a lot of mentoring. Um, and in 2020, I came through and was um, put into the role of the director and four months later, Will became the chair. So thank you to you both. So um, now what we have is a situation where we are Māori led, um, working in Tiriti partnership, but working in a Western framework. So that's incredibly unique. So what we've achieved for this current five-year uh, term, half of our funding is going to Māori-led projects, and that means we have growth in Māori researchers and leaders throughout all of our organisation. We privilege Matauranga alongside Western science, and we do that by, instead of thinking, oh, the only place to uh, gather knowledge or information is from journal articles you know, around the world, uh, for Māori, it's going to be perhaps in things like waita, karakia, motiatia, and whakairo, or carvings. And so information is gathered from there. They'll have um, kōrero with the uh, community that they're working with. And then the outputs, yes, there'll be publications and then there'll be reports, but there may be things like a haka or a carving as well. What we also do is empower communities to ask the questions that they want to ask, and then we, make sure we ask them to work with uh, researchers that they trust. Over the last five years, we've been consistently aligning our strategies, our leadership styles, our communications, and our images. And last year, a massive piece of work that we did. Um, so uh, Rebecca, our comms advisor, Kore Hata and I met with Ariki Creative, and we started talking about the legacy of our website and how we had four main areas of research. And as we're doing that, we're talking a little bit about aging well and what we do and how we do it. So we got four tohu and core whaiwhai panels in order to represent our research. But in addition, uh, Tane recognised that there was something a little bit different about us. And so he created a fifth one, which is called core tahitanga, or the togetherness. And that's the core whaiwhai that's um, along the bottom as well. So our website looks very different now. And the other thing we've done at Aging Well is we support collective Māori leadership. So um, just as I was joining the Rawi Kamanai um, was established, I became a member of that. We've put out really important documents about how science should be done in partnership with Māori. Um, and it's yeah, been an absolute pleasure to be involved with them. So to my Aging Well Fano, thank you so much. Um, I've loved being part of that, uh, this organisation. Um, and to my Rawika Mānai colleagues, they are amazing in the mana that they hold when we sit at the table. I sit in awe of all of them. I have one little extra piece of um, information to share with you. So um, I'm actually one of five children but in order to show you this, I have to show two separate photos. And that's because my sister Jane passed away when she was only two years old. Now, anyone who's experienced that knows that um, that rips a hole in people's hearts in the whanau. And during those early years, my mum and dad patiently explained what had happened when we're asking questions like, Where Jane? where's Jane? Why can't we play with her? And implicit in the messages that they shared was how important research is. So Jane had a congenital heart defect. She had underwent two highly experimental, profound hypothermic open heart surgeries during her short life at Green Lane Hospital. And so our discussions would talk about that. And we'd also talk about, well, when's enough? When is it time for the person to rest? My parents were amazing. Dad, you're absolutely amazing, you and mum. Um, as you stepped, you were having to deal with your own grief. And then we were, you were having to step us, uh, Michael, Jonathan, um, and I through that as well. Um, and of course, an experience like that influences who you are and what you do. So for me, it means that what do you want to do with your life? Life isn't a rehearsal. Get on with it and start making a difference. But also, something that I learned from my mum was that some of the experiences she had when Jane was with us is how important the compassion and kindness from others 
were when you're dealing with four children, one of whom is very, very ill, um, and in, in order to navigate those simple tasks such as just going to the supermarket. So, um, to my siblings, Michael, Jonathan, Amy, um, and Jane, we are also very different, and, um, and that means we bring really different skills to our whanau. Um, and while I live down here, you still live up in Tool Bay mostly, or very close to it, and um, you get to see each other all the time. And what I love about that is that Joseph, William, Shelby, and Maddie get to spend that really close relationship like we had with our cousins um, when we, we, we were kids. Now, Mum passed away eight years ago, and we all really, really miss her. But I always sense her with us, keeping an eye, making sure we do things right, but I also see, and I see her, I see her with a little bit of a twinkle in the eye, just encouraging the moko to be a little bit mischievous, but not too naughty, you can't be naughty. So um, yeah, I always feel her with us when we're together. So a few more people to thank um, to my family around the Motu and um, across the world as well. They've shared this journey from those early, early days. To my godchildren, um, it's been a pleasure to share your journey um, as you've been growing up. And to some very close friends, um, I really appreciate the fact that these friends, um, some of them uh, get me to share books with me so that I um, get escape the science and start to think about other things. And others of you um, make me use that tiny little inkling of my brain that is creative when we have potluck dinners and I have to come up with kai that fits a theme like sunshine. <laughs> so thank you, you it's wonderful to, to um, share the journey and um, with all of you. So to anatomy, it was a pleasure to join Anatomy in 2010, and I was thinking about well, when I interviewed, I was looking at the department, and I realised even then that half the faculty in the department were women, and that was un incredibly unusual. So I looked up this morning, uh, and although half were women, only a third were um, at professorial level. So I looked up this morning, and not only do we still have half of our women um, in our faculty, but we have more women than men as professors, is what I realised. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure to actually um, join the department and step through my career with you. To Brain Research New Zealand, um, I really loved um, the opportunity to be funded by you, but more importantly, the leadership opportunities that you gave me over the last um, eight years. And to my Te Pautama Māori um, colleagues, um, we have the best training, we have the best kōrero, and I really appreciate the support that we give each other um, throughout our career. Nō reira e um, we're right at the end, so um, thank you for hanging in there on this journey. Nā mihi, nā mihi, nā mihi ki a koutou. Mm -hmm. 
I'll wing it. So, um, um, tēnā koto, oh, is that it? <laughs> tēnā koto katoa, uh, ko Ahorangi Christine Jasoni toku ingoa, ko um, Tumuaki Te Tarikiko Kiko Aho. Um, so, my name is Christine Jasoni. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Anatomy, where I'm also the head. And it's my great pleasure to be able to be one of the people um, who does a little closer for Louise. So, I was asked to um, thank Louise as well as to comment on her lecture. Um, but where to begin? Um, I guess the first thing that I wanted to do really was just to thank you for the lecture, of course, um, and for taking us on a journey through your life. Um, before science, um, during science, and through your scientific career. And um, although I wasn't the head of the department when you went through, um, of course, Louise and I started off in physiology in the very, very early 2000s when I was a research fellow and she was a PhD student. So I've kind of also been along for the journey as well, watching her grow as a scientist, but also really watching her leadership um, journey um, and I think one of the things that's been um, really, really impressive about it is not just what a fantastic scientist Louise has developed into, but also the leadership journey and the leadership journey that has woven together her whakapapa and how that has, has driven the kinds of things that she's been involved with as a leader um, and, and has actually helped to shape within New Zealand, many of the, the approaches that we now are starting to, um, to undertake, both at government level and also in, um, in our everyday departmental university lives. And that really is the weaving together of um, her Pākehā as well as her Tangata Whenua ancestry and bringing that together in all aspects of her work so that there's co-leadership, co-creation of ideas and ways of doing things. And I think you could really see that in the way her research transitioned from very Western basic science to recognizing the need for reducing inequities in the way science and, and its applications are delivered and to do that with um, not just the basic science lens, but also the Maori lens in order to bring about um, not just research in Parkinson's disease, but research in um, movement disorders more broadly, which are responsive and appropriate to all communities. And, um, you know, giving rise to um, much more accessibility um, in the solutions that are found. And I guess I wanted to just finally end by um, sort of thanking Louise for the role that she has played in a very small way, but in the same general way um, within the department. Many of you will be aware that Louise is the deputy HOD Maori in our department. So she's bringing what she described to you that she was able to do in her work, particularly through the Aging Well National Science Challenge, and bring that Te Tariti led um, partnership and leadership and co-creation to the National Science Challenge and um, is helping, instructing, supporting me um, so that in our department we can collectively grow and also be te tariti led within the university. And so, um, you know, just I guess in finishing up what I wanted to say is that it's just the drawing, the weaving together of all these aspects of Louise that have made her not just a stellar scientist, a stellar Maori scientist, but a stellar human being who contributes in multiple ways in our science system and in helping our communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I guess I just wanted to end by asking you then all to thank, to join me in thanking Louise for the wonderful talk she gave tonight. Uh, kia ora.
tuitahi haki e mihi ana kia koutou o tāko te mana whenua koutou ngā uri waka eke o puke kura o te moana e ripo ripo mai nga e mihi ana kia koutou. I o te anō tēnei au e uri nō taranaki maunga e mihi ana ki tēnei whare wānanga e nō oku tūpuna o pakakohi o pari aka i āwhina ki te hanga i tēnei whare wānanga. Tēnei ka mihi ake ki te kaupapo te rā ki tō tātou tangata. Te uri whaka heke o mani o poto. Te uri whaka heke o te aroa. Tēnei ka mihi ake ki a koe. My name is Will Edwards. I'm from Taranaki. I'd like to acknowledge o tākou, the mana whenua of this place. Um, I'm, I'm from Taranaki and I mentioned um, my ancestors were imprisoned here as the Pakakohi prisoners and the Parihaka prisoners who laid some of the foundation stones literally of this institution. Um, but I acknowledge Louise and her Te Arawa Whakapapa and her Ngāti Mani o Poto Whakapapa. I acknowledge what Louise is bringing to this university. And Amy, I know you're coming up here very shortly. I'm just the real Johnny come lately in this one's journey. Um, Di, what a vision. Di and Dave. So cool working alongside Louise. Sometimes I forget that she's actually an expert in some of this stuff. And, and you know, orienteering, I know that I don't need Google Maps anymore. <laughs> because I get lost all the time. And um, I've learnt so much about you personally, having worked closely with you. And uh, o tāko whakaihu waka, a nei te whakatina natanga. So the name that I understand is currently being debated, here is the embodiment of that, of the reciprocity, of drawing on knowledge systems. Um, Barry? E mihi ana ki a koe, in your whakapapa from England, Robin Hood. Robin Hood, that might make this the sheriff of Nottingham. <laughs> this one doesn't rob from the rich. She works at System for Social Justice and Equity. And I'm sure, and I know her mani o poto, and I know her te arawa, and certainly her Māori, Colleagues and relations are so, so proud of her. Amy, where are you? It's time for you to come and speak. Uh, e mihi ana ki a koe, ki tō whānau, ki tō tātai whakapapa, te whakatīnana tanga o tāko whakaihu waka, e mihi ana ki a koe, tēnā tātou. This is a lot more nerve-wracking than Louise said it was. Kia ora koutou, he mihi nunui tēnei ki a koutou, ko a tainui me te aroa ngā waka, ko Ngāti Maniapoto te iwi, ko Barry pā tōku mātua, ko Geraldine pā tōku whaia, ko Leon Sargent tōku tānei, ko Joseph Rawa ko Mary aku tamariki, ko Amy Sargent tōku ingoa, Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, hello everyone, my name is Amy, I'm Louise's sister. We are like really happy and privileged to be here today to celebrate Louise and her amazing achievement. Louise has been a hard worker, determined and strong, like all her life since she was born. Um, <laughs> Dad said Louise was always a leader um, even when we were children, she was always very responsible um, for the rest of us children. <laughs> and mum would always say to me that Louise could achieve anything she put her mind to in life. Louise was an exceptional student at school. Uh, by the time I went to school, 
the teachers were never calling me Michael's little sister or Jonathan's little sister. It was always very fondly Louise's little sister. Uh, so it was a bit of a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, in fact, in one of the lockdowns, I found Louise's old school reports and it really blew me away um, how amazing she actually was. I think one teacher actually said she was the most wonderful student they had ever had. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> um, which is pretty impressive. Um, but it wasn't just in school that Louise was a high achiever. It was actually in music and sports and orienteering was our favorite thing. Um, it brings back all the memories um, of our weekends when we were kids and doing the orienteering together and supporting Louise when she was in competitions. Um, and Dad mentioned to me the other day, he's always been so very proud of her, the way she represented clubs and national teams. Um, and he loved supporting her and seeing her through all of those years when she was competing. Um, Louise has always been a very supportive sister. She's an amazing role model for her nieces and nephews. And as an extended family with our cousin Mark, who came down from Whangarei today as a surprise as well, our whole family, we are very, very proud of you today, but we're proud of you every day as well. And Wheezy, you did... Oh. <laughs> Honestly, for weeks I've been thinking, don't call her Wheezy. <laughs> Sorry. She, she's always my wheezy, so. Um, you, you dedicate your learnings, your experience, your culture and your knowledge into helping others and you are always looking for ways to advocate for others and we think you're really amazing for that and it would be something that would have made mum so, so proud and we are all very, very proud of you, so thank you. That's on. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Neil Gemmel tāko um, So I'm Neil Gemmel, I'm the Acting Deputy Pro Vice-Chancellor for Health Sciences uh, and also a former Head of the Department of Anatomy. So it's, it's, um, it's all about anatomy tonight, uh, but it's also all about far now. Uh, and, and I just want to reflect, I've actually got the easiest job, I'm, I'm actually, all I'm meant to do is say, hey, please come over to the staff club where we've got kai and drinks. Um, but I, I want to take the opportunity uh, just to say what a wonderful, joyous um, IPL this has been. Um, uh, because it's about far now. It's about uh, your family and also your academic family celebrating your success, Louise. And uh, it's extraordinary. Um, so I've walked that journey with you a little. Um, and and I, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the University of Otago and the Division of Health Sciences for. Your, your wonderful science and your wonderful leadership. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of Anatomy for what you have given and give to our department. Um, and I want to thank you on behalf of Aotearoa New Zealand for the leadership that you show uh, weaving uh, Te Ao Māori uh, with our science uh, system here. We are on a, all on a journey uh, and uh, we are growing and um, better for knowing and working with you. So kia ora and thank you. Uh, so now, um, just to finish, uh, over at the staff club, uh, we have Kai uh, and we would be delighted if you could come and just join with us and, and continue the kōrero and, uh, and, and um, you know, congratulate Louise in person for what is a marvellous achievement and a wonderful IPL. And just going for a moment, just off script, um, just to, it's been my huge privilege to um, lead this and I will conclude because as well, well as uh, Otaka Whaka Ihuaka, a place of first, we are also Te Wharewananga o Otaka, a place of traditions. And one of the traditions is that the IPL is a test and you passed and, the, uh, and in, uh, in passing the test we have on behalf of the university a gift, a traditional gift for IPLs that I, it's my pleasure to present to you tonight, Louise, thank you. Didn't want to get away.